just want to welcome you all. I am Mark Fraley the, with the Political and Civic Engagement Program at Indiana University. I am here with Emily Pike, and we are actually here in person, live. Uh, and the, this is, I know, <laughs> this is, uh, uh, so this is, this is an exciting uh, uh, means of kind of uh, uh, having at least two people in the same room together is one step uh, closer. And so as we are, getting vaccinated and we are getting our own uh, uh, health under control. Hopefully we can be able to have more of these types of events that can include more than two people, but we are happy to be here right here at the New Hope for Families uh, shelter. And uh, again, if you're just joining us, um, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, say hi, I'd like to be able to start by thanking all of the sponsors uh, for Wake Up with United Way. We've had a great uh, series. We are going to continue to have more. Uh, Bloomington Township uh, is the premier series sponsor and also the presenting sponsors are the IU Credit Union and the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. And I'd like to thank our program sponsors at Duke Energy and Old National Bank. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being with us uh, today, for getting up uh, early in the morning to be able to talk about really important issues facing our community. And of course, today we're talking about housing first. Um, and so we're going to be talking about some solutions to dealing with uh, homelessness and some strategies for, um, for ameliorating the situations of homelessness in our community. And very happy to be here uh, in the flesh with uh, Emily Pike, uh, the executive director from uh, New Hope for Families. So um, Emily, if you want to just, for folks who don't know you, if you want to just uh, introduce yourself and a little bit about what New Hope does. Absolutely. So my name is Emily Pike and I'm the executive director here at New Hope for Families. New Hope is our family shelter here in town. Uh, so we serve families impacted by homelessness and we do that in two ways. The first is that we offer shelter to families impacted by homelessness. And the second is we offer early childhood care and education to families impacted by homelessness. Uh, they're prioritized in a mixed income cohort. Uh, so that's what we do here at New Hope. And we're proud to partner with all the other sheltering agencies. Um, <clears throat> it also happens that this year, uh, I am the chair of the South Central Housing Network, which is the collaboration of sheltering providers uh, and homeless uh, and assistance agencies in our community who work together to, to be productive on this problem. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about housing first and um, you'll have the option of being able to post questions. You can use the Q&A feature uh, in the chat. So try to use the Q&A feature to pose any questions for Emily uh, rather than, than the chat because that way we can guarantee that we're going to be able to see them and get to your questions. Um, so if you want to give us a little bit of rundown, you know, we hear a lot about different um, strategies for dealing with homelessness, and obviously homelessness is something that's been a uh, huge issue in our community um, as of, of late. And so what is housing first, and how is that an effective strategy for ameliorating homelessness in our community? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I've got a few slides. Would it be please, okay if I shared those? Please. Yeah. So let's see here. You guys will have to bear with me. I was just sharing with Mark that I have somehow made it like pretty far in my career without ever learning to be good at PowerPoint. So you were all about to bear the brunt of that. Um, so let's see here. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maybe to reduce this. I, yeah, sure. Oops. This is my, uh, uh, inability to use Max, that was the issue, not. So between the two of us, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> We're a fully competent person when you combine us. <laughs> so Mark, is it okay if I share a few slides here about housing first? Absolutely. And then we can go into some questions. Please do. Okay, great. So um, housing first, uh, you know, in Bloomington, we talk a lot about our homelessness uh, situation. And it's something that a lot of people have strong opinions about. And it's something that's really top of mind, especially recently. And that happens for us every few years here in Bloomington, where it becomes something that feels like it's not tenable anymore and we're looking for new solutions. Um, I have good news and I have bad news. Uh, the good news is I'm not here to propose any new legislation. So everyone take a deep breath. Uh, and um, we're also here to, to talk through some, some 
solutions. The, the, the bad news is that there's no kind of one size fits all solution here. What we're going to talk through is a, is a broad philosophical approach um, that we can be thinking about as a whole community, um, and that is housing first. Um, before we get into housing first, I want us to be thinking about what does homelessness look like in Bloomington and in Monroe County. Um, so we every year do something called a point in time count. Uh, so the point in time count mark is a uh, count one day a year. Where we actually go out and count all the people that we know about who are experiencing homelessness. So we do that in a few ways. Um, we go outdoors to the places where we know people are. We go to the service providers where we know people are. We go to shelters, we use paper surveys, and we also use an online database that many of our service providers participate in to count every year at the same time how many people in our community are experiencing homelessness. Um, so how many people are there? In 2020, uh, in January of 2020, so pre-pandemic, cast your mind way back, um, there were 334 people impacted by homelessness in our community. Uh, and that was 240 households. You might be wondering what a household is. Uh, 39 of those were families with children and they made up 128 people. So that's just about 40% of our homeless population. Uh, 194 were households without children. Uh, that's 199 people. So just about 60% of our homeless population and seven households were only children. So those are unaccompanied youth. So those are folks uh, just making up uh, just under 2%. Uh, so a, a relatively small part of our population there. Um, what we're not counting here are people in hotels. We're not counting people doubled up. Sometimes people are in between leases and they'll say, oh, Mark, I'm homeless for two weeks. No, you're not. Um, if you have a safe place to sleep that isn't provided by a service provider, then you're not homeless. You're just inconvenienced. Um, so these are folks who are literally homeless. Um, where are they? So more than 300 people in Monroe County are in emergency shelters or transitional housing. So when you think about all of our service providers here in town, that's Middleway House and the Rise, that's Beacon, that's Wheeler, that's New Hope for Families. So those are the places where we go to count uh, where are folks, oh, I'm sorry. And it's also um, stepping stones at, at Center Stones for our unaccompanied youth. Um, uh, 36 people were unsheltered at that time. So that is between Monroe and Morgan County. We don't have an exact breakdown. We know that most of those folks are in Monroe County, but probably a few were also in Morgan County. Um, I included some things about subpopulations here because we get asked a lot. So chronically homeless folks are 49. So think about that. That's less than 15% of our total. Um, folks with serious mental illness were 97, substance use disorder 96, and domestic violence survivors 51. So uh, those are just out of adults for those ones. So it's about 40%, 40%, and 20% uh, of people uh, going down that list there. Um, so our goals around homelessness as a community, we understand that our ability to completely eradicate homelessness, very small, maybe non-existent, right? It's a bigger problem than that. So our goal is to make it rare, to make it brief, and to make it non-repeating. So we want not very many people to experience homelessness. When they do, we want it to be short, and we don't want it to happen again. That's what we're looking for. Um, so how we do it, uh, sorry, this is how we used to do it, as housing readiness. So housing readiness, Mark, is a broad mm -hmm. philosophy that says, let's fix the problem so that you can be housed. Uh, you're gonna move through progressive stages of independence to build readiness, mm -hmm. and you're gonna learn how to be housed and stay housed. So basically what it says is, you know, here I am at New Hope, and I say, oh, Mark, I'm so sorry to learn that you and your family have become homeless. Come on in, sit down, have some coffee. Tell me everything that has happened here, and we're gonna work on fixing those things so that you're ready to live in a house again. Um, now, in some ways that seems to make some sense, right? We don't wanna just throw our resources away, right? If Mark and his family can't live successfully in a home, why would we invest so much money in getting them ready to be there or in, in putting them there before they're ready, rather? Um, so that is something that seems like it makes sense uh, until we start thinking about why people become homeless. Um, so spend a second thinking about that, if you would, um, and then go ahead and tell us, if you would, raise your hand and tell us 
you know, why do you think people are experience homelessness? What's what what do you think is going on there? Oops. Uh oh. Uh oh. I don't know how to show the participants. Mark, do you know how to do that? Oh, we aren't. However, if you'd like to um uh put that in the chat, maybe. Oh, there that, you that go. might be a helpful if you want to be able to kind of suggest why why um why you believe people experience homelessness um put that in in, in all the right chat. mary allen says a lack of income or support emergencies jeff says not enough affordable housing affordable housing affordable housing mm. well, there might be there's going some, some trends going on mm -hmm, here yeah mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. catastrophic events wages are too low mm -hmm. Low wages, high rent, domestic violence. Very good one. Thanks, Deborah. Low wages. Yes. Thank you, Penny. No safety net. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Bankruptcies due to medical bills. Thank you, yeah. Nancy. Very good point. Uh, medical bills and, and medical problems in general. Um, cost of living or not making a living wage. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of low wages and unaffordable housing. Absolutely, so yeah. yeah. And if you think about that, that's literally what happens, mm -hmm. right? That is how people become homeless. Um, some other contributing factors <clears throat> might include uh, a mental health problem, right? Mm -hmm. Might be a substance use disorder. You might have some kind of a physical, oh, th th someone just yeah. said, yeah. thank you, Judge, Judge Stafford. Stafford. Yeah. Um, so you might have some some compounding factors. And one of the things that we know uh, when we think about working in this field is that it's almost never one thing, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you are underemployed or unemployed uh, and your housing's too expensive and you had to be out for a few weeks. So when you didn't have your safety net, uh, everything just kind of crumbled around. Uh, maybe you do have a serious substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do have a serious mental health problem. Um, these are things that that absolutely do impact a lot of people in this country, and some of those people are people impacted by homelessness as well. But here's the truth about that, and this is the most important thing that we can remember about the housing readiness model, which, again, is the way that we used to do things, is that there is almost nothing that causes homelessness that's going to get better while you're homeless. Almost all of those things are going to be worse. So when you think about that, when you think about, okay, if the reason that you and your family have become homeless is because there's a substance use disorder, right? Mm -hmm. Think about what it's like to try and be in recovery when you're living on the street. Mm -hmm. um, think about what it's like to try and treat a mental health problem when you're living somewhere that's not safe, right? What we know is that those are things where you need to feel safe in order to be able to proceed, mm -hmm. right? So that's really important. <clears throat> and it's something that... Uh, when we think about it in this way, all of a sudden that housing readiness model is really counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And when we think about those simpler solutions or those simpler problems to solve, it's even worse. So if you are trying to get a job, well, let me tell you about trying to get a job when you don't have an address. Think about trying to get a job when you don't have a place to take a shower. Um, these are, you know, job interviews are, are, you know, terrifying enough without having to deal with it in that way. Um, so being able to think through that is something that, that helps us figure that out. So whether that's a problem for someone else in your family or for you as the head of household, these are things that are gonna be more easily solved uh, when people are housed. So like the previous model then you're saying is like we're sitting down and talking to people about these problems that are in, in some sense, you know, you're dealing with this earth shattering issue that you don't have stability, you don't have a place to sleep, you don't have a place to, you know, a, a regular meal. And how are we supposed to even think about, you know, things about, you know, maintaining whatever sort of work habits or to be able to deal with addiction issues or anything like that, unless you have that center of stability, right? It's like asking somebody to, um, I, you know, just go for, uh, uh, into uh, heavy exercise and pure eating and everything like that right away when they've got thousands of other sorts of you know issues that they have to be able to deal with before they can get to that point so yeah you just hit the hail, hit the nail exactly on the head that's, yeah. that's precisely what we're talking about we're asking people to fix these things before they can have their very most basic things mm -hmm. taken care of and none of us are good at that right um so you know you might say okay 
sure, it doesn't make sense to try to go vegan right now. Mm -hmm. um, even though maybe we should, probably we should. I don't know. I'm not a nutritionist, but <laughs> seems like that's likely. Um, but but maybe some of these bigger things we do need to fix before mm. people are ready to be housed. Um, so think about this for a second. Uh, right now, there are about 15.3 million people in this country living with a serious mental illness. So I'm not talking about a little social anxiety. I'm talking about a serious mental illness. 60% of those people aren't even treated. And most of them are housed. Uh, there are 20 million people uh, in this country who live with a substance use disorder of some kind, right? Uh, about three quarters of those folks have an alcohol dependence uh, and the remainder have an addiction to some other substance. 38.1 uh, million people in this country live in poverty and 9.8 million people as of April were unemployed. So think about that. Those are all the people, all those problems that we just listed. These are those folks. Just over half a million people right now tonight are experiencing homelessness. So that's when you think about that, right, Mark? So we said, oh gosh, well, the problem is I've got these mental health problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, 40 times this many people have a serious mental health problem and most of them are not homeless. Most of people living in poverty are not homeless. Most of people living with a mental health or with a substance use disorder are not homeless. Mm -hmm. So when we think about that, that's kind of where we, where the, the wheels come off the wagon a little bit. Um, and sometimes those tend to be things that are actually maybe more about our perceived like moral failings or the ideas that we have around these particular problems. Um, but when we think about that, um, you know, that is not probably the, the most effective way to solve this. Um, so if housing readiness isn't the solution, mm -hmm. what is the solution you might ask? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it's housing first. That was uh, my question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So housing first um, was conceived nearly, th nearly 30 years ago. So it's not a brand new program. Uh, it started in New York City and it started with this idea to serve these really high needs populations, right? So we're thinking about um, people who are chronically homeless, people with major barriers to, mm -hmm. to housing. Um, and so it started off with just trying to serve those folks and saying, well, what if instead of asking these folks with a serious mental illness and an addiction who have been living outdoors for years, um, instead of asking them to work their way through these you know, graduated programs and sheltering, what if we just started with the housing uh, and then worked on the other things? Um, and so that's where the name came from, Housing First. It's quite intuitive. Uh, it's really not a trick. So doing the housing first and then doing the other things. Um, so since that time, it's really expanded into a, a broader philosophy, um, but building on the evidence of those early successes. So uh, sometimes we used to talk about housing first as a specific program was housing first, which is that it gave people housing first. The way that we're talking about it today is as a broader philosophy. Um, and it is it does stand in, in reaction to housing readiness and, and actually in opposition to housing readiness. Um, so it is, in fact, uh, the broad philosophy that says, let's house people so they can address their other problems. Do you remember housing readiness said, let's address the problem so we can house them. But it turns out that barrier to housing is really just mostly in our minds. Um, so what does it mean exactly? Um, so it has, it's a broad approach to working with people experiencing homelessness that puts housing at the center. Um, so really, as Mark just said, it's putting first things first, uh, being able to, to think through what are the things that, that are the most important. And at its root, the only solution to homelessness is housing, right? I mean, it's there in the word, right? It's homes. Um, so housing is the top priority. And then you use a voluntary services model for everything else. So voluntary services says that, you know, um, your, your budgeting classes, your parenting classes, your addiction recovery, um, your mental health counseling, uh, your uh, job readiness work or uh, vocational rehab maybe, these are all things that are optional and they're there to help you get housed. Um, so they're not things that are barriers to housing, they're things that are tools to get into housing. Um, it means being low barrier, so housing first says people are ready for houses. So let's be ready for them. 
Um, and it's person-centered and it's relationship-based. So it wants people to be able to have a little bit of autonomy mm -hmm. and a little agency. You know, the way our systems work so often is really well designed to take that away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, and, and again, Mark has already said this so well, um, meeting basic needs is generally a prerequisite to higher level functioning, right? So this really just takes some, some principles that we've all agreed on for a long time in every other part of service provision and applies them to sheltering and, and homelessness services. Um, so the role of shelters in homeless or in housing first, uh, sometimes there's this idea that maybe housing first is anti-shelter, mm. um, that it says, okay, well, if we're doing housing first, then we don't need shelters anymore. And, you know, first of all, gosh, I wish that were true. Um, but it's not. Uh, shelters are are not the enemy. Uh, fun fact: I run a shelter, as you may remember from the beginning of the of the uh, conversation. Um, they're not the enemy, but they we, it does kind of require us as sheltering providers to think about it a little bit differently and about what we do. Um, so it calls on shelters to use a housing first service model, which is, as we said, to offer services with as few barriers as possible and ensure that all supportive services are voluntary and support housing. Um, so that doesn't mean that we have no rules, right? We still have to keep people safe. We still have to keep our property safe, but it means that we think really carefully through those and say, do we really need that to be a rule? Does it have to be the case that you can never have a drop of alcohol? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I have some drops of alcohol in my house <laughs> and everything seems to still be standing there. Um, you know, so I, when we think that through a little bit, what does that look like in the bigger picture? Um, uh, we wanna be able to move households into sustainable permanent housing as quickly as possible. That has to be the number one goal for our sheltering providers. Um, and we wanna participate in collaborative housing first practices. One of the things I love about Bloomington is that our providers here work really well together and they're almost always like on the same page about where we're going and what we wanna do. And so this is one of the things that we do pretty well. Um, but that is something that we have to do if we wanna be doing housing first, we gotta figure out who the people are um, and be willing and ready to help them. And the most important one is that we have to shift our success indicator from the number of people that we shelter to the number of people that we house. Mm -hmm. And that's really tricky. Um, and it's tricky for a few reasons. First of all, we've done that way for a long time. So there's some inertia there. But secondly, um, that's the most impressive number I can ever share with you is our nights of shelter last year. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is. And I, I now feel embarrassed that I didn't look at that before I came on, but it's something like 20,000 nights of shelter wow. last year. It's a lot. Um, and there are some other providers in this community who do many more nights than that. Um, but when we think about what our goal here is, um, so, that just means we let someone sleep here once. Um, what we really wanna be doing is help them not sleep here, right? Mm -hmm. Our success isn't filling shelter beds, it's emptying shelter beds. Mm -hmm. um, so the housing first best practices there uh, have to do with diversion. Mm -hmm. So diversion is thinking through whether a person really needs to enter shelter. If they have any other solution, we'd like for them to take that solution. Um, so housing first means any kind of housing that's safe, right? So maybe you're staying with your mother-in-law and you really don't get along with your mother-in-law. Maybe you're cramped where you are. Maybe your commute is too long. Maybe you don't like the city that you're in and you wanna to go to a different city. Those are all valid feelings. Um, we wanna support you to have a better solution, but I promise a homeless shelter isn't that better solution unless you're really not safe there. Um, so we want to do some direct outreach. We want to go where the people are. So sometimes uh, people come to us, but sometimes especially our really high needs folks don't come to us. They felt a little burned by the system. And so we have to be willing to go where they are. And we have to remember that every day that folks stay unhoused, those complicating factors are, are probably getting worse. Um, we want to do coordinated assessment. So we want to be able to have a tool that says, okay, here is what's going on for this person uh, so that all the service providers can kind of know uh, where they are and, and what is likely to be useful to help. Uh, and we use that to make a by name list so that we know. So if you, if you went to a meeting of our sheltering service providers in this town 
uh, this afternoon, um, you would see that there is literally a list of all the people who are experiencing homelessness in our community right now and the solution that we think is best for them based on all that individualized conversation, based on that assessment. Uh, and we use that for coordinated entry. So that's what those meetings are called, um, mm -hmm. where we talk through that and we say, okay, well, Mark's family, you know, they scored a, a four. And so I think what they need is a little help on their deposit and we'll be able to get them into, into rapid rehousing and we'll get them out of here. Mm -hmm. um, and this other family, gosh, they really have a, a lot more barriers. So they might need a more permanent subsidy. They might need something like, like public housing or section eight. Um, but it helps us determine what is the smallest effective intervention uh, for each household. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, one of the things that kind of really strikes me about, you know, this whole model is, and you mentioned like, you know, it's a person centered um, approach and it seems to be that this is very much anchored in building relationships and getting to understand other people, what their needs and concerns are rather than sitting down, having uh, this, these concepts in our head of, okay, well, you know, we know that problems with addiction and mental health, we need to take care of all of those different types of things. And so you kind of have a standard approach towards dealing with all individuals. And this is much more about um, building those relationships and seeing where um, people can actually get the most benefit out of. That's, right? yeah, you, you've, yeah, that's 100% correct. And just realizing too, you know, uh, one of the things that we're learning to do better in general is, is yeah. hear people who have that lived experience, uh -huh. right? Um, so probably Mark and I are not the best people to guess what someone might need, right. you know, who might be um, the people who are living it. Mm -hmm. um, and so trusting that experience, trusting them to report what's going on for them and trusting mm -hmm. them to work collaboratively to make a plan that's going to work for them or for their family. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what that ongoing case management is about. It's about mm -hmm. meeting people where they are and helping get to the next place. Um, housing first tools. So uh, I want to walk through this. <laughs> I don't want to get too in the weeds with y'all, but there are you know, a few things that we as sheltering providers use to help people move through homelessness and into safe and stable housing that they can afford. Um, so one of them is, is market rate housing. Uh, so that's, you know, I'm not going to read this to you, but it requires only a little bit of financial support. So maybe that is someone who is, like I said before, literally just between leases, right? And they just had to use every dollar they had for their deposit in first month at the new place. And they've got 12 days with nowhere to go. Um, well, we can help. Um, we, we'd love for that not to happen for them, but if it does, uh, that that's something that we can do. Or maybe that's someone who was, um, cost burdened in their in their old situation uh, and had to look for a new place that was a little bit more affordable for them. Mm. Or maybe it's someone who moved to a new city and they had a little bit of a break in their employment. Mm. But either way, it's a it's uh, someone who has a, a pretty short term problem. Uh, oftentimes these folks maybe were informally housed before. So they were just staying with friends or they were staying with family members and they didn't have a lease there. Uh, so sometimes these are younger folks who may be establishing a lease for the first time. Uh, rapid rehousing is a program that uh, helps people kind of hit reset. So it's good for people who have income. Uh, it's good for people who uh, are, you know, e either working or have some other pretty reliable source of income that is enough to pay the rent. Um, but something happened probably again, they were cost burdened in their old situation. Right, so something has happened that's caused some things to build up over time, and they're not going to be able to afford their deposit and their first month's rent. They may have some back utilities, um, and in the old model, we would say, "All right, well, stay here in shelter, get a job, and save up some money so that you can take care of that back rent, so that you can pay Duke, so that you can pay Vectron, so that you can pay the City of Bloomington utilities, um, and so that you can get your deposit and first month's rent on your new place." Mm -hmm. Well, that that could take months right? And that's not the best solution most of the time, right? The best solution most of the time is, okay, what can we do to get you into housing now uh, so that you can move forward, right? This isn't about being punitive or, or thinking through what could have gone better last time. It's really about thinking about how it's going to go this time. Um, an ongoing subsidy is something like a Section 8 voucher, maybe, or public housing. And that's for someone who consistently doesn't have enough income. 
Uh, that might be someone who's underemployed. That might be someone who's not able to work. That might be someone who often is on disability, really hard to pay rent on disability. Yeah. So those folks may or may not need intensive case management, mm -hmm. but they definitely need an ongoing subsidy. So those are programs that allow people to just pay 30% of their income, mm -hmm. whatever their income is. So if you're making $612 a month, you're going to be paying about 200 bucks, mm -hmm. right, for your rent, which is then an affordable place for you to be. We know that for all of us, we want us to be paying about 30% of our income mm -hmm. uh, toward rent. Unfortunately, that's not always attainable in our community. Um, and then permanent supportive housing. This is one of the things that we often associate with Housing First, but it really is a very small minority of people impacted by homelessness or served by sheltering providers. So if you think about it, it is for people who are chronically homeless and headed by a person with a disability. Um, so if you think about that, we, we know that in our community, fewer than 15% of people are chronically homeless. Um, and an even smaller percentage of people need this kind of intensive support. Hmm. Um, and so this is a, a, a long-term financial support and long-term case management. Uh, and again, it's really a very, very small number of, of people that we're looking at. Um, Okay, what is in Housing First? Uh, so a lot of times we have this conversation and there are some ideas out there. So we're just gonna dispel some of those real fast if that's okay. Uh, it's not housing only, right? It's not calling for anybody to hand everyone housing and walk away and hope for the best, right? In fact, that's the opposite of what we're asking. Um, what we're saying uh, is let's do the first things first and then do the other things. Uh, People need the other things to varying degrees. Um, it's uh, also not usually uh, free housing. Um, it's, in fact, it's almost never free housing. Um, and it's, it's often subsidized. And that kind of depends on, on the situation, how long or how much it's subsidized. Um, but it does call for that ongoing case management and wraparound supportive services. Um, it's not one size fits all. Uh, so as you pointed out earlier, it's really case specific. And what we're always looking to do is the smallest thing we can do to be successful because we want people to have that agency and they want to have that agency. Mm -hmm. um, and it's low barrier. So low barrier means that what worked for mm -hmm. you and your sobriety may or may not be the thing that works for me and my sobriety. What works for you and your employment mm -hmm. may or may not be the thing that works for me and my employment. Um, so thinking that through making a plan, it doesn't mean that people are off the hook and can do whatever they want. It means that we're going to be thinking about them and not some generic person, uh, out there in the ether. Uh, really importantly, it's not a treatment program. Mm -hmm. So substance use disorder and mental illness are their own problems. Um, and they require their own solutions. Uh, so housing first can be a precursor to treatment or uh, mental health therapy, uh, and it can help slow the progression of those mm -hmm. things. Um, but it's not gonna be something that on its own fixes substance use disorder. And sometimes that's one of the criticisms of having first is that, oh, well, all these people are, are still struggling with these addictions. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Um, that's like being concerned that your, your kid's reading class didn't, didn't solve his obesity. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the goal of it, right? They're right. both important things, um, but they're not things that are necessarily fixing each other. And I think we can all know many people who have addiction issues who live in lovely houses, right? Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's clearly not like that type of panacea for all of a person's uh, emotional health and uh, other types of issues that they may have. That's such yeah. a good point, Mark. You're, you're exactly right. Um, so we're almost through um, with this, uh, with these slides here, and then we'll just talk for a minute. So who is Housing First for? Uh, really importantly, this is the broad philosophy. Housing First is for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, housing First is for everyone because housing is for everyone. Um, and some people just need more support than others. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is most people need a little support for a short period of time. Um, and, then they're, and then they're ready. Um, and some people need a little more support over a longer period of time. A um, few more things really quickly that Housing First isn't, just anticipating some of the questions we're gonna have here. Um, it is not a solution for an affordable housing crisis. Um, it moves people into housing more quickly and it does a decent job of keeping people housed. 
but it's not going to prevent homelessness for people who aren't engaged with the systems. Um, it's not going to solve our affordability issues. It's not going to keep people uh, from doing that. It's not the only tool that we need. Um, it can reduce chronic homeless numbers over time because it keeps people from becoming chronically homeless who are homeless once um, or twice. It, it helps reduce that time and it reduces the amount of time that people are homeless so that our numbers on a given day are lower. Um, but by itself, it can't be, so remember we wanted rare, brief, and non-repeating. So it does okay, or it does pretty well at brief, and it does pretty well at non-repeating. Um, but it's not gonna do great at rare all by itself. Um, so we need additional prevention tools that are targeted, um, and we need regional solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about this isn't something that we can solve just in Bloomington. Um, this is something we have to be thinking about all over because just like most of us in Bloomington, people who are homeless are from a lot of places around here. I myself am from Lawrence County. Um, I don't know, where are you from, Mark? Central Illinois. Central yeah, Illinois. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of us came from other places and some of our folks who are impacted by homelessness may also have come from some other places. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a cure for poverty. Housing first is not something that's gonna solve poverty. Poverty is a major systemic problem uh, and homelessness really is just a tiny sliver of that problem. Um, but it is something that can help with our homelessness problem. Uh, and it is something that can help with, with economic problems for the people in those systems. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's housing first. Um, why housing first? Uh, it helps people, right? Very straightforwardly. Um, people who are served in a housing first model spend less time homeless. And the duration of homelessness is one of the strongest indicators of the long-term effects. That's true for everyone, but it is especially true for kids. Um, and remember that more than 25% of the people who are homeless in our town right now tonight are children. Um, people are likely to stay housed and it preserves people's dignity. Uh, and then from a more utilitarian standpoint, housing first saves money. Um, so we see reduced ER visits and medical costs. We see fewer arrests. Um, and we see fewer resources spent on solutions that aren't going to last mm. and more resources spent on those long-term solutions. Wow. So it went really fast through that, Mark. I'm sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> that was this. incredibly informative. And I think, um, I think a lot of us have been hearing a lot about um, responses to homelessness and housing first. And so thank you so much for being able to put that so succinctly and, and clearly. I know that we have a few questions coming up in the Q&A. And the first is from, uh, from Tonda. From Tonda. Um, so other than township trustees, you know, uh, MACM, SVDP, what short-term financial resources are available to those uh, on one-time support needs? And mm -hmm. where can they go for navigation assistance in short-term case management? Absolutely. So um, in addition to and those- I think that's on topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, in addition to those things, um, there are many faith communities that offer support. There are some nonprofits in our town who can offer support. Um, and there are, uh, these, these service providers are always help, happy to help with case management. So that's Wheeler, that's New Hope, that's Beacon, that's Middle Way, that's Stepping Stones. And it's actually a lot of other places that do that case management as well, even places that aren't sheltering providers. So mm -hmm. if you wonder uh, which ones they are, a great mm -hmm. place to start mm -hmm. is the United Way website. A lot of them are United Way member agencies. Um, really importantly, we do have a rapid rehousing program in this community, and that is run by Beacon. Uh, so they do that out of Shalom Community Center down here on South Walnut. Um, and that is the program uh, for people who are, are able to sustain a lease but need some help with that down payment um, first month's rent. Uh, it is only for people who are literally homeless, um, and they does require a referral from a sheltering provider. Um, yeah, that's certainly helpful. We have also a question from Josh, um, mm -hmm. because, uh, and, and, and so this is another thing that we've been hearing a lot lately, because we just did a series of waking up on, are we uh, facing an eviction tsunami? And mm -hmm. so this is obviously something that's on our mind. Do you offer assistance to people behind on rent who are at risk for eviction? 
So there are some state programs yeah. right now that do that. Uh, if you go to indianahousingnow.org, you'll find mm. several different programs that are aimed at helping people who are at risk of eviction. Mm. Uh, all the things that I talked about today, however, are for people who are literally homeless. Mm -hmm. um, there are some additional solutions that are available through the Bloomington Housing Authority in terms of helping people access housing choice vouchers mm. to shift into a less cost burden situation. Um, there does tend to be a long wait for those, um, but it's something that's worth exploring. Uh, and our hand department mm -hmm. offers some solutions for folks as well. So um, a person who might be able to help you there is Tonda Radawan, the master <laughs> of the previous question. And uh, I see uh, Jen is also uh, pr uh, providing some resources in the chat. So oh, thank um, you, Jen. So thanks for, for providing those there. Um, Nancy Richmond is asking, what are the primary barriers in this community to a housing first model? Mm, that's a great question, Nancy. Um, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit complicated to answer and I don't want to take too long on it. Um, one of the things that I like to think about when we're thinking about that question is it's not really that we're housing first or not housing first, right? We're, we're working on this and there's a continuum. So, you know, my agency, when we first opened, we were not really following housing first principles. We were almost exclusively following a housing readiness model. Um, that was 10 years ago. Um, and since then, we uh, know a little better, and so we're doing a little better. Uh, and I think that is true for most of our sheltering providers. Uh, there are some providers who are doing it before us, um, and there are some who are, who are getting there now. Um, but thinking through uh, what that means is it does take that philosophical shift. So it does take this community-wide commitment to it, um, and it does take that shift away from how many people did you serve? How many mm. nights of shelter did you offer? To how many people did we get into stable housing? So thinking through what are the barriers in our community, certainly affordable housing is one of the barriers, right? That's one of the things that keeps people in homelessness. Mm. We'd like to move them out of it. Um, and another one is really just this, I think, misconception about what is the effective way to do it and what people need and don't need. Oh, wow. Um, Excellent. Well, thanks for that question. And there's, yeah, I'm sure there's, we could have a whole nother series probably just talking about some of the challenges there. Um, having a, I think we have other questions that are, oh, Let's no, okay. okay. Are there more up there? Sorry. Oh, all right. So Peter, um, we have uh, uh, council member Iverson uh, is asking what books that you would recommend. Oh, okay. Well, there are a few things to think about. Mm -hmm. um, there are some great online resources. Um, the National Alliance to End Homelessness is a great place to start. Mm. Um, the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, uh, that's mm. a mouthful, ihcda.in.gov, uh, uh, has a lot of information about Housing First. There's also um, this book that I think Peter might be referencing, which is the book on ending homelessness. Um, and it is uh, written by an individual called Ian DeJong. Uh, and he is the person who helped develop the vulnerability index, that coordinated assessment tool that we talked about earlier. He's, he's part of the group that did that. And he has a lot of experience using Housing First. So he has some really good ideas about just practical things um, and works to dispel some of those myths that we talked about mm. earlier on. Oh, wow. Excellent. No, and, uh, and, and so we can also send out some of those resources that Emily just mentioned to folks afterwards. We always like to be able to encourage people to engage in, 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 in the advocacy direction. So what we can send um, a list of resources afterwards. All right. Um, and Tonda, what is the criteria to be literally homeless? That's an excellent question because you referenced that a couple of times. Yeah, so I think maybe we mentioned it earlier, but it is um, sleeping in a shelter, mm -hmm. sleeping outdoors or in a mm -hmm. place not intended for human habitation, or in some cases, sleeping in a hotel or motel that is paid for by a service provider. Mm -hmm. But it means you literally don't have another place to be tonight. Yeah. Um, so if I can stand Mark's couch, mm -hmm. um, I'm not homeless. Um, at least not tonight. It doesn't mean that I'm not housing insecure. 
and that's a bigger issue, but it does mean that I'm not homeless tonight. Right. And so that's like probably for, for some of us, when uh, we're going between housing situations, we might want to use a, another word like, hey, can I stay with you? I'm homeless right now. Right. right? Like that's probably not something that- uh, Right. Is, that's a is, colloquial use of the term. It's a colloquial <laughs> use of, <laughs> of, 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 of the term. But yeah, so you're really talking about people who literally do not have a place to sleep. Um, uh, Mary Ellen Jones, uh, what type of collaborations do you do with providers that help with some of the other barriers, um, including mental health, disability, employment, and do you offer regular collaborative uh, provider meetings? And then other than referrals, are there other ways that outside providers can be more active and effective? Uh, great question. Um, so again, uh, one of the best ways that we have to collaborate with other providers is the United Way. Um, for me, that is one of the, the strongest benefits to being a United Way member agency is that I get to go and hang out with all of these other fantastic nonprofit leaders. So, you know, we saw Nancy Richmond uh, on here mm -hmm. uh, and Nancy Richmond leads HealthNet here in town. So you might've noticed that she was bringing up some things about uh, medical bills. Mm -hmm. Well, that's precisely what HealthNet is here to do is to help with those things. Um, we may have some people with disabilities who need some additional supports. Uh, and thankfully, we've got Life Designs, we've got Stone Belt. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about mental health problems, we collaborate with Centerstone. There are all sorts of food insecurity issues happening in this community. Um, and so, you know, we've got Hoosier Hills and we've got Community Kitchen and we've got Mother Hubbard's Cupboard and a half a dozen really uh, low barrier and accessible pantries out there. Um, and I think now we're finally in a position where we have a pantry every day of the week. Thanks to, I think the People's Open Pantry yeah. was our last one. Um, but really, uh, and, and I, you know, I recognize that this is a United Way event, but truly that's what I say to everyone when mm -hmm. they ask how we collaborate. Um, the, the housing issue specifically, we do a lot through the housing network, but for everything else, uh, the United Way is where I build those relationships. Mm. And I think it's where a lot of our other leaders build those relationships. So I know that that Forrest and Deborah would, would say the same things sure. about their agencies as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, I actually think that that um, invites uh, an excellent question for the people who are here in the audience, you know, for because we have a lot of people who wanna watch this webinar mm. and, do what they can to support the housing first model, right? And so what opportunities for are there for people in the community to uh, either advocate for housing first or do more uh, to support housing first in this community, in this region? Mm. Wow, that is a great question. And mm -hmm. I confess, Mark, it's not one that I felt really, I, that I feel really prepared to answer. Um, one way might be um, making a generous contribution to New Hope for Families. Absolutely. You can always make a generous <laughs> contribution to New Hope for Families or to the United Way of uh, Monroe County. Um, you know, I, I think the first thing that we can all do is really take some time to examine our own preconceived ideas mm -hmm. about what homelessness is, what causes it, and what the solutions for it are. Mm -hmm. um, because I think even, even, you know, Bloomington is such uh, a compassionate, uh, and thoughtful place. Um, but even we have these ideas that turn out maybe not to be really evidence-based mm -hmm. um, when we get down to it. Uh, and that's not because anyone's looking to, to spread misinformation. It's just because it seems like it makes sense until you know all the things and then it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the first thing that we can be doing is just ourselves thinking through, okay, what what is it that um, that makes me think that. Um, and the second thing is to work on our housing and security problem as a whole. Mm. Um, you know, homelessness is, is one part of our housing and security problem, as we said earlier, but not everyone who's housing insecure is homeless and not everyone who's housing insecure is gonna be homeless, mm. but it doesn't mean that that situation is okay for them. Mm -hmm. And so anything that we can do as a community to be moving toward solutions. Mm. Um, so when you think about where you want to make your charitable giving, when you think about how you want to be involved as a volunteer, really think through, is this a solution that is evidence-based? Is this a solution that's going to be part of this broader philosophical shift? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, you, you just about can't make a bad decision here in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. we got a lot of people who are working hard for good solutions. Um, but I do think 
hold it. Sometimes we have this idea um, that in order to be successful in service provision, what you need is a big heart. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, that's nice. <laughs> um, but you also need a lot of information and some skills. <laughs> um, and so really thinking through that um, and, and beginning to see this as, as a, a professionalized uh, field that that needs to be taken seriously if we're going to be moving moving the needle on yeah. this issue, you know. No, so that's good. I mean, I, I so I, I think having one takeaway message is to be able to challenge some of our own assumptions about homelessness and how people end up in homelessness is probably one of the key takeaways uh, in in order for our own engagement and to be able to be better uh, volunteers and then you know to be able to challenge some of the myths while understanding that maybe sometimes your social media thread might not always be the most effective mm. uh, platform for dispelling myths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, good point. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, I want to, um, so we got a, another question from uh, Scott Mickelson. Uh, what are the ranges of times that people have experienced uh, from first experiencing homelessness crisis to moving into a permanent supportive housing solution? Oof. Great question, Scott. And I'll confess, I don't have an answer for it. I can give you a general ballpark though. Um, so uh, you have to be chronically homeless to qualify for permanent supportive housing. And I wish that I had that definition off the top of my head and I just don't. Um, but generally it takes people a couple of years uh, at least to be chronically homeless because it has to do with a certain number of incidents, instances of homeless in uh, homelessness in a period of time. Uh, and a cumul cumulative number of days of homelessness. So that is something um, that uh, we can, I will happily send to you uh, after this, uh, but I, I'm, I'm really sorry, I don't have that uh, off the top of my head, but it's generally a couple of years and often longer um, that it takes someone to, to be chronically homeless, uh, have that definition, and then to actually like qualify and move into permanent supportive housing is going to take even longer. So it is a period of years. We're not talking days or weeks. Excellent. Um, going to the chat, a uh, question from uh, Joe Gilbertson, who's talking about um, many of their clients experiencing long waits or no response at all when using applications for Indiana uh, housing now. Um, so what has been your client's experience? So it, there has been a long wait, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, you know, there are a lot of people trying to use those resources. Mm. Um, sometimes the problem is that maybe a client didn't attach a document that was necessary. There are a lot of things that you need to, to put with that application. So it's always worth checking back in there to make sure that nothing was missing. But unfortunately, it isn't a fast process. Okay. Yeah, I wish I had better news about that. All right. Well, excellent. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes. Is there anything that you would like to kind of uh, uh, wrap up by, by by sharing, or what are the key take home messages you would love for the folks in this webinar to uh, come out and and engage with? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it really just is that that housing first is our best tool right now, mm -hmm. um, and we're still learning about all the ways that we can do that best. Um, again, we're not, we're not all or nothing. Um, we're all working toward being, being better at it all the time uh, to, to think about what other barriers can we remove and what other ways can we creatively house people. Um, but I do think, you know, it won't come as a surprise to anyone that, you know, affordable housing mm. is going to be what we need. Um, and affordable housing isn't an excuse to stop working on this now, right? We can't say, oh, well, we don't have enough affordable housing, so never mind. That would mm -hmm. be great if we just had an infinite number of low-cost apartments. Mm -hmm. um, no place has an infinite number of low-cost apartments, and there are a lot of communities who are making a lot of progress on this. Yeah. So we can too, and it's something that we, it's going to take a lot of working together. It's not something that the nonprofits can solve. It's not mm -hmm. something that the city can solve. It's not something that the county can solve. It's something that we're all going to have to work together on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that collaborative work is, is what's going to, what's going to move the needle, I think, in the long run. 
Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for all of the work that, that you do on this. Uh, and thanks to all of our community members who uh, took their valuable time uh, early in the morning to be able to join us and learn about these important issues and to be engaged in, 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 the, in the solution. I want to once again, thank our, uh, our, our, our sponsors, our premier spon uh, series sponsors, Bloomington Township, presenting sponsors, IU Credit Union Community Foundation of Bloomington Monroe County, and our program sponsors, Duke Energy and Old National Bank. Um, thanks again to all of you for being with us. Thanks for Emily to be with us. It was nice to be in person uh, uh, with, with someone for one of these uh, one of these events, and we hope to be seeing you all in person out and about in the community uh, very soon as we're all emerging. So thank you so much for being with us today and, uh, and, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.